welcome. Grab a seat, please. Dirk, anywhere you lay, Jose Manuel from Endesa is going to moderate the panel. This panel is super exciting, and we're going to continue the conversation. Moderated by Almost Endesa, done. who are going to be the guys powering the electric cars, Dirk is going to join us and continue the conversation about the opportunity with Hyperloop. We have Berta Barrera from Renfe, who has already been pioneering in the space with high-speed trains across Europe. Amadeus, of course, are connecting all the transportation at the back end. Near is making things easier for the consumer with Move It. And of course, Barry Schuller from DFJ is financing some crazy transport companies in this yours, space. So. so, Jose Manuel, over to you. Thanks. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much indeed for being here with us today. Thank you very much, uh, particularly to Barry Schuller, to Dirk Alborn, to uh, Nier Erin, uh, to Berta Barrero, and to Alex Luzarre and all of you for being here with us today. The panel is going to be really sharp. We are going to take only 25 minutes to go to the future of transportation. We are really excited to have this opportunity with these panelists uh, to understand what is going to be the vision of the transport in the future. First of all, I have to say that we are delighted to have all of you here. Many of you have traveled long distances to be here today. That means and uh, defines the fact that everyone uses transportation every day, how important that is, that is for the life of everyone, and how important is going to be the future of transportation for the economy of the world and for the society. I have to thank the organization of the, com of the event and the South uh, Summit for inviting us as Enel and Nessa to moderate this panel. You have to be patient with me. I'm a doctor engineer. I'm not a moderator of panel or speaker at all. I'm going to try to do my best. Anyhow, and this and NL are trying as well to be involved and contribute to this future of transportation. A great deal of our projects in our portfolio of innovation are projects in uh, sustainable mobility and electric transportation. We hope that the cities and the mega cities of the future will see an economy based in electrification of the demand, in decarbonization of the power generation, and of course, as Dirk mentioned before, green energy and the integration of renewables in this society of the future. We are really honored to have these panelists here today. I think that they don't need uh, much presentation for most of you, but I'm going to present uh, Alex Luzarga from Amadeus, Managing Director and he's working in the future pro uh, projects and products of the company, and he's aiming to shape the future of travel. He'll tell you how they are, they are going to do that. Berta Barredo, on my left, uh, Managing Director of Operations at Renfe, with a great experience for many years dealing with high-speed uh, railways uh, network here in Spain and also abroad. Uh, probably a competitor of, uh, of the project of uh, 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 Dirk, uh, Erin, Erin, er, uh, Nir Eretz, sorry, Nir Eretz, uh, CEO at Muit. I'm not sure if all of you know the application and the services of Muit, but they are revolutionizing the way in which people is moving around more than 600 cities in the world right now. Dirk Alborn needs no presentation at all. He's a, a serial entrepreneur with many years with experience in all the parts of the business. And as he mentioned before, technology is, is only a part of the picture. It's only a part of the equation. We all know that for being successful, successful in innovation, we have to build a really successful business model, and he's uh, capable of doing that for sure in Hyperloop. He'll uh, tell us, I hope, afterwards how they are going to manage the financials and the whole business model for the project. And finally, Barry Schuller, uh, probably accredited as one of the pioneers of internet in the world with a great experience in uh, venture capital, right now partner of DFJ, DFJ and with investments in uh, some of the most successful companies that you know, like Twitter, SpaceX that we have seen this morning, and as well uh, Tesla Motors and uh, some other companies related particularly with my business with energy generation and renewables. That's it. I think that uh, we have coped with the presentations and uh, go directly to the topic, to the subject and to the core of the panel. 
I have to say that uh, many people think that the technology in uh, transportation is not evolving so fast as, as many other technologies like uh, biotech or information technologies or nanotechnology. Some of you are convinced that this situation is going to change, that very soon we are going to see in the next future and the years to come a much more faster evolution in, in the technologies of uh, transportation. And this is my first point for the panel. I would like to open the debate and to know from you what is your vision? What do you see the future of transportation at all levels? I mean, personal mobility, mobility in the city, intercity mobility, intercontinental transportation, and even transportation in the space, as we have seen with uh, SpaceX. Then uh, I'm not sure if some of you want to break the ice. I can start, you know, telling you about what users really want and what users really do, and it tells you where the market is going. So 20 years ago, 10 years ago, transportation was clearly segmented, you know, long distance versus metro transportation, and within the metro was clear public transportation operated by government or municipalities. And what we see today is that there is a there's a meltdown, there's a merge between different means of transportation. So if you commute within the city area, you have options today that starts with public transportation with multiple options. Then you can combine it with taxi ride or carpooling or car sharing or even rent a bicycle. So all of a sudden, and this is what we're doing at Move It, we're trying to bring to the local people a list of options that combines alternative means of transportation. All of a sudden, you can take a taxi to the train station, take a train ride, and then a carpooling or car sharing uh, business can offer you the last mile. My clear vision, and I actually see it happens, is that means of transportation are merging together to become a more of a smooth ride that eventually all people will care about will be the destination. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I want to agree. Okay. Can, can you hear me well? I want to agree on, on that. I think that uh, having a, a seamless experience as a traveler is essential, and you need to combine all these new means of transportation. And uh, I don't know if it sucks uh, traveling, but definitely there's room for improvement, right? Uh, and if you think of how much you have to wait in the airport for security, for checking, then to board the plane, then maybe for checking in the hotel or waiting for the taxi, all that is clearly, uh, there is room for improvement there. And if you combine that uh, with the fact that uh, travel is going to grow and grow, transport is going to grow, there, go there will be more and more needs for moving people from one place to the next. We have uh, an important challenge ahead. And I think that technology uh, should fix or try to fix that. So incorporating new content like the Hyperloop or maybe the driverless car as well, which is a uh, I believe something uh, very interesting and is going to probably also impact impact the travel very much. All that is uh, is a nice technological channel Ch uh, challenge. Sorry. Once you have uh, mentioned the the technology about the driverless cars or autonomous vehicles, in which I think uh, Barry Schuler is uh, as well very interested. Uh, Barry, sure. you have the word. Well, you know, it's funny. I uh, flew here from San Francisco. I guess I started on Monday and came here yesterday. And I was on a 747, which actually was designed in the 60s. I was even little in the 1960s, so, you know, that's really old technology. And when I got to the airport, I was uh, in an Audi car of some kind, whose biggest innovation was when we were stopped at a red light, the engine turned off to try and save a little bit of pollution and uh, uh, energy. Um, and if you look at transportation up until now, uh, we've had very incremental change. Yes, the 747 was designed in the 60s, but the electronics are relatively new. Thank you very much. Um, but fundamentally, there have been no bold moves in innovation um, in transportation until very recently. And it started really with uh, Elon Musk, who uh, we invested in at Tesla. A Tesla Motor Company was a very, very hard project to do. Almost failed twice, but for the first time, there's an all-new car on the market. And I think that tells us that 
a bold innovator who wants to come into the market and innovate no matter what it is and take on hard things can, can succeed. So now what happens next? Well, you know, I think probably the most interesting and exciting technology that's coming along for transportation is self-driving cars. Um, you know, cars were invented a long, long time ago. Um, and one thing that has been proven in the 150 years or so they've been around is that humans are terrible drivers. Um, a lot of people die on the road, we make bad decisions, and uh, now we have the technology to change all that. And if you think about self-driving cars on highways, they start to look a lot like trains. Now, they won't go as fast as yours, because we'd love to have yours as well, but I would like to call uh, you know, Uber, who will have a self-driving car, to come and pick me up and go. So our view is, don't be afraid of innovating. Um, there's huge opportunities, because we're sort of at that point where people have seen what they would think was a really hard thing to do, and that is innovate. You know, the automotive industry is totally possible. Dirk, how do you see the future? What is your foresight? So I think we have a big problem right now. And we don't really realize it being in Madrid, but even in the United States, you don't realize it. If you go abroad, if you go to India or China, you really see the problems that are there. But even in Los Angeles, I mean, you choose where you work based on where you live, because you choose it based on your commute. You choose who you date based on where you live, because if she lives an hour and a half away, that's not going to work ever, right? If you have to pass a four or five freeway, that's... Uh, so there's 50 million people in cities like Beijing. These people, I mean, traffic creates huge damage to the, to the economy. And uh, so it's not really a question anymore about uh, are there going to come innovations? They have to come innovations. So the problem, I think, in transportation is that it's very much connected with um, the public sector, right? It's uh, infrastructure most of the time. So you need the government. And without the government in transportation, things are very much complicated. Uber is fighting very hard to uh, be able to be, be anywhere. And obviously, you know, it's difficult because there is there's laws that uh, that were created before. So in the future, I think self-driving cars are the most interesting and most exciting part, because actually we might be able to not have uh, all those parking lots anymore, but we we're going to have cars that are moving around. We can have more parks, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to that future. Um, we have to become green. That's an important part, and um, obviously, you know. As Hyperloop, we don't only look at the technology. Technology is one part. That's e actually easy, but the business model has to be there. It has to, it has to become a business model. Right now, public transportation doesn't make sense, and that's a problem. So you have to make it sense. Okay, Did, uh, you have mentioned the problems of pu public transportation. That uh, gives me the word to pass uh, through to Berta. Berta, first of all, sorry for leaving you the last to speak, the lady. But uh, they gave you the opportunity to speak about public transportation. You have a great deal of experience, and probably you have as well an idea about the future of uh, transportation, and particularly the future of high-speed trains. Well, it's a pleasure because we have now in a bullfighter arena where the Spanish knows how to deal with this kind of moments about, <laughs> about the question. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to highlight a, a thing. Modems transportation are not the end of the question. Must be the right and the better tool for the mobility of the people and give solution and experience. And because of that technology and digital transformation we need. Because of that, it's not only a question of which is the better modern transport, it's which is the modern transport that fits well, gives the, the, the right solution for its need. And not everybody, and not every society, and not every local community has the same need. We need to uh, manage the right solution of transport for the right community. Everything. Uh, from my experience, for example, uh, Hyperloop, I, I see that could be the right solution for the future. I know how many years we need to ride this spread on over the world. Because high-speed trains, for example, the now high-speed train we have in Europe, for example, in Spain, where that we are the, the, the first, uh, first country in, in, 
in Europe and second country in the world after China, that we have uh, the longest period in high speed train. High speed train uh, is the evolution of the railway, the traditional railway, and the traditional mobility of people in the world. We have need more than 50 years to achieve all of these solutions, and we need, uh, we have this solution to give for our society for the next 50, 40, 50 years more. Probably after these 50 years, Iperlut could be the right solution, but we need this solution for the present and for the short term of the, of the, of the time. Um, at the end, it's a question of cost of the investment. It's a question of cost, and I know that the most cost is the expenditure as software, technology, because mechanical devices are very simple. All the devices regarding with technological and software are very costly, but are very useless, useful for, for our uh, uh, goals. Uh, I would like, from my point of view, to, to highlight four key words for the future of transport. Safer, quicker, easier, and cheaper. Because the society needs for the future is smart, smart modern transport, safer and quicker. I agree with you that at the present, the many of much of the many of the accidents we have on different modes of transport, cars, rails, uh, are because of the human factor, and because of that, it's, it's good to to go on uh, finding a solution for driverless or um, RMTS, in case of railways, RMTS solutions. But I need also modes that preserve the environment, modes that not only provide a treat, but also a travel experience, modes cheaper, not only for the client, but also for the operator. And more and more excellent in the customer services, friendly and reliable for our uh, clients, and at the end, for our citizens. Thanks very much, Eberta. In this fighting between uh, Hyperloop and high-speed trains, <laughs> obviously cost is a, an issue, and safety, we, we are sure that we are going to comply with everything. But uh, what I'm not sure is about uh, another uh, important topic that you said about what is the travel experience? What is the experience of the user? What is the job to be done for all of us? What do you want to half when we travel. And then I'm not sure if we want to enter into detail to compare high-speed trains with uh, Hyperloop in terms of the user experience, or I can uh, give the word to yes. Nier to speak about uh, what is the feeling of having movies and the services of your company right now. So I think user experience, you know, with all the money that exists in the VC community or in many investors in the world, it's going to be very difficult to really upgrade the system dramatically. It's very, very expensive. But if you think about the situation, you'll find that the most important thing for users, the thing that frustrated them the most, is lack of information. Lack of information caused a huge waste of capacity. Let me just give you an example. About two months ago, or a little bit less, there were two full strikes of the London Tube. So think about it, 10 million people that used to go every day with the tube has to find an alternative, had to find an alternative. And we saw a spike of a 400% usage of Move It and figure out, people figured out that they have alternative by just using the bus. What it actually means is that in London, and it's actually relevant for every large city, the capacity of buses and subways and trains is actually built to hold about twice or three times more than what people really need, but people don't have all the information at, uh, available for them. And this is what is really changing in the last three or four years. With the small device that's called smartphone that connects you to the internet, but in the same time positioned you GPS-wise in a specific location, now you can provide people with a very accurate information about what's their best way to go from point A to point B. This, in, this technology was actually uh, not available 10 or 15 years ago. 
And if you think about it, nothing really changed in London public transit system or in Madrid public system. Of course, they are developing every year, but very slowly. But the fact that information exists makes the user experience completely different. So three years ago when we started, people were just sending us hundreds of thousands of emails, thanks guys for the information. Today, three years later, they are complaining about 30 seconds delay in the real time of the buses. So that's what really changed. People are now used to get more accurate information. They want to know the exact uh, estimated time of arrival using public transit, not their car. So they want to make sure that all these moving parts are going to work together in a very uh, efficient way for them to get to their destination. And I think that's the main difference in user experience. People are way more spoiled, I would say, and they would like Uber car to get in three minutes, not 10, not five, three minutes. And they would like public transit to be available for them and very, very accurate. So that's the big change in, in user experience. Thanks, Nia. <laughs> I, uh, I, I fully Alex. agree. Maybe I, I, I like to comment a bit more, but I think one, uh, uh, one aspect of technology is the big projects, uh, Hyperloop, uh, uh, driverless cars, etc. And this is, uh, this is great. No? This is the future. Uh, but as well, how you combine all these things uh, and, you, and you share information about all the players that are part of the traveler experience is critical. So you can have the best things, but if the information around that is not properly managed, it's useless, I think, or, or the experience is still very, very bad. And if you think of uh, a person that goes from the airport to the hotel to the airplane, uh, most of the applications of these players do not talk to each other or are not connected or are not connected real time. Um, in Amadeus, for example, we, we are studying a, a situation where you, when you have the, uh, the airplane that is delayed, and then on an automated fashion that should be connected to the airport systems, so the new gates are assigned to that plane, and that information is flowed back to the, to the airplane, to each passenger, so you know which is the new connection gate in the plane in real time. Uh, Many of these type of things do not really exist today on a, on a massive scale. And it's a pity because then you have to wait more. Uh, and then is when every time there is a new change, your travel experience is, uh, is not optimal. No? So in managing information is very important. Dirk, what exciting things are you preparing for uh, us as possible users of Hyperloop in <laughs> terms of travel experience? So. I completely agree. It's um, you know part of it is a digital part. As I said earlier, it has to be as simple as pushing a button and get as close as possible to teletransportation. Right? You want to really be able to um, be guided through this whole process. So we're actually working on creating a platform, an infrastructure that where other players and can help us because we don't we don't believe that the, that we are the best ones where we can come up with all the solutions. So we're trying to build a platform where you can, yes, plan your Hyperloop, but you plan your Uber within. You um, Maybe someone else can build an app on top of that platform to give you a virtual ride, to, um, of an historical ride, for example. So there's a lot of things, I think, that can be done in order to make that experience better. And in itself, inside the Hyperloop, obviously, we had a lot of challenges. Because um, when the white paper came out, it, yeah, it wasn't really the best uh, transportation method. But you want to build something that a two-year-old wants to take as much as an 80-year-old wants to take. So we actually had one of our team members. She has her mom, and she's like, her mom is totally, totally scared about the Hyperloop. So we printed out a picture of her mom. It's called Yaya's mom, and it's on the wall. And every time we were talking about design, we was like, what would Yaya's mom say? And um, I think now, two years in, I just saw her mom. She's all excited about writing it. So uh, I think we have achieved the goal. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really something. Inside the capsule, you, we have problems because um, people might be afraid, right? They're always hearing about the speed. And um, some people talk about it's, it's like these things in the bank where you get sucked through the tube. Well, it's not like that. Okay, so it's uh, it's actually it doesn't it doesn't feel much different from anything else you have experienced. We limit ourselves at one g in acceleration, one g in deceleration. So 
we, we did a lot of technology um, research for the levitation and proportion so that it's a comfortable ride. And the, all these things, when you do a new technology or something that new like the Hyperloop, the important part is actually to get the people convinced to use it. Right? So usability and how it integrates into existing and in, into the existing infrastructure is super important. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm afraid we are running out of time. We are barely entered the subject, but I don't want to go without giving you young people, young entrepreneurs, people uh, involved in innovation uh, to have a look of the future. Barry, from your venture capital activity, you have a good outlook of what is coming. I think that you are the best person to illuminate this audience about what they are going to see in the future, what they are going to enjoy in the future, probably us which are older not, but uh, they are pretty young. What is coming in, in, your, uh, in your view? Well, I think you're hearing a little bit um, from the panel members about um, how profound being able to hook things together, link things together, the fact that if you think about Uber or Lyft, there's nothing new, they're taxis and limos, but because we have such great technology in our, our mobile phones, we can have them come to us and they're really big logistics companies. So now think about building on top of that. Um, for example, everybody flies and everybody has baggage anxiety, right? If you're doing carry-on, you're worrying about getting on there and stuffing your bag up because God forbid they have to like, you know, put it in the baggage claim. And then if they, you do check your bags, you have to wait forever for get, to get them. But now, with a huge network of all these cars running around and connectivity, Planes could actually um, get rid of the carry-on, have you check everything, but you would never have to worry about it because it'll be in your hotel room because it got there via Uber car. Now, I haven't seen a company doing that yet. If anyone's working on one, you can come see me. But um, certainly the technology exists to make that happen. And I think we'll see more and more leverage of the connectivity and the marketplace um, uh, the marketplace systems that are out there at scale to make travel more convenient while the more big, profound changes come. When there's Hyperloop, when, when there are autonomous cars, robot cars really, you won't need to own a car, um, you won't have parking lots, you, you, they will just be circulating around. Um, a car will always be a minute away and you'll hop in it and hopefully it'll safely take you where you want to go. How far out is that? Um, well, technologically, we can actually do it pretty well now. The hard part is getting the robot cars to get along with human drivers and, uh, and people getting comfortable, and that's probably going to take 10 to 20 years. Thank you very much. We haven't even had time to speak about drones and many other interesting and exciting technologies uh, that can be applied to travel, but we have to leave. Unfortunately, we have to leave the panel here. Thank you very much to Barry. Thank you very much to Dick. Thank you very much to Nier. Nier. Sorry for the name. Berta, thank you very much for coming. Alex, it's a pleasure to be here with, uh, with you and with South Summit on behalf of the organization and Enel and Endesa. I thank you very much. I wish you the best time in Madrid. Enjoy Madrid. Enjoy the South Summit. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you.